excited about this evening, uh, mainly from a staff perspective, because it's our last event of the sustainability week. <laughs> and it's been a long, long week. But we're really, you know, to be serious, we're really excited about having uh, Dr. Richard Poppenlander here today to talk a lot about food and food choice. And this wraps up or is the culmination of the College Reads program and the emphasis on food throughout the uh, entire academic year. So I think this is a fantastic way to kind of wrap up where we are. Before I introduce uh, the doctor, I would like to just kind of go over kind of the second year in review here. Really, it's about a year and a half that the office has been, um, we've been in, uh, functioning here at the college. Um, but, I, I, I'm a Mac guy, I can't, he sees now, he fuddled me. Um, so a couple of things that we, we want to highlight today. Really the second year we focused on development. And I think we spent a lot of time on student development. So that is how, how do we begin as an office that's situated in business affairs, yet is run by an academic. How is it that we begin the process of helping to bring in students in a way that allows them opportunities to develop? When I say develop, I mean how is it that students can really get to that high impact learning, which requires that applied aspect to their theoretical and conceptual work, how is it that we can get them to that space and provide that space and that autonomy for them to work and develop? So that by the time they graduate, they not only have the foundations of sustainability, but they have a skill set in sustainability that makes them very attractive on the job market. My theory is we don't just want to graduate students. We want to graduate students that are empowered and have the opportunity to be successful in the real world as they hit the ground running. And I'm not sure that the higher education system currently is set up to be able to allow that to happen. So consider this an experiment, the Office of Sustainability. I, I consider it in this kind of light. I mean, we really try to work on waste and energy issues, but there's some larger dynamic here about sustainability that's so critical to not only the campus, not really even the community, but I would say how we start to think about ourselves as a species. It sounds really profound, but this is what I'm attracted to. It's not really environmental protection. With all due respect, it's not really about food. It's really about choice. And what choices do we have? And how is it that we're going to construct our human society? How is it that we are going to define our core purpose as a species? How is it that we're going to bring these things together to link them in a way that is sustainable for future generations? So for me, it's not necessarily about the environment, it's not necessarily about economics, it's not really about justice. It's all those things. But really, there's something more fundamental to this, and it's about connection. And that's what we're really emphasizing in the Office of Sustainability. So what we've done this year is we've developed a climate action plan. It's, let's call it a working draft of a climate action plan that we're going to send out for all students and faculty to be able to comment on publicly so that it becomes our document, and we get a document that we can embrace as a community. So that's something we work on, and, and I'll be quite frank, we've got it to the point where it's a pretty unique document. What we're trying to do in this document makes a statement about the College of Charleston. And I'm really curious to see what the community has to say about this. So that's something that we, we really spent a tremendous amount of time, as I told my boss, Steve Osborne, who's the Executive Vice President of Business Affairs, an embarrassingly, uh, an embarrassing amount of time on that. Uh, campus projects, we have them going all over the Cape, all over the campus. Uh, I'm really proud to say that the vast majority of these campus projects are run by students. The idea is not to micromanage students. The idea is to empower students and give them their space and autonomy in order to figure out how things work. Unfortunately, some students, most students, all students learn the hard way. It's really hard work doing this stuff, this sustainability stuff. It's not just about the end product. Uh, we've created a sustainability practice network. Um, that is, we had a sustainability committee. It was a centralized kind of place for, for thinking about sustainability. Some really impassioned people were on this, this committee. 
but it really wasn't functioning in a way that I thought that, the, that, that brought the community together. So what we did in this place, we created a network of 15 working groups around particular, particular issues from food to water to carbon neutrality. And we're asking faculty and facilities, um, people from the physical plant, architects, all of the people here to come work together, students, um, even classes are coming in some of these working groups and working on these. I really think that's a very powerful aspect of what we're doing. Um, then Synergies. We've created a magazine that's going to be released in a few weeks. This is the wireframe for it. And uh, we're calling it Synergies. We're not calling it something around sustainability. We're calling it Synergies because the core of sustain sustainability is really connection and the synergies that we create. And we're doing it in a regional way. We want the College of Charleston out in front lead in the region on sustainability issues. So this is going to be a great way for us to kind of start to create that vehicle forward for us to do that. We participate in Recycle Mania. We've always participated in Recycle Mania. But this is the first time that we've kind of started the competitions portion of it and really kept empirical data on Recycle Mania. Uh, Broward Crater Outreach to the Community, Elementary School, Middle School. Um, we've tried to accept just about every opportunity that's been presented to us, we are now getting to the point where we're getting a lot of requests from the community to go out in the community, and that's exactly what we want. That's where students are going to have to develop more. I can't do it. Jen Jones, our facility, facilities coordinator, graduate assistants, there's only so much we can do. We're going to need students to start from the time that they're freshmen, so by the time they're juniors and seniors, they become the educators on these things. We're not quite there, but we're starting to set this up. Um, we're working with new student services. And orientation, I'm going to speak in every orientation session to both incoming parents, incoming students, and parents. So it gives us an opportunity to start laying that foundation. And then I'm really proud to say a long process to get this bike share up and running. Uh, it's been a long time to get this thing up and running for a lot of reasons. Um, but we finally launched that bike share uh, on, uh, on Tuesday. And there's... <laughs> There's me uh, riding the first, that's the first bike uh, in the bike share. So the, the, fun, the, the second aspect of this, we'd like to thank really the entire College of Charleston community because it's really not the Office of Sustainability. It's really an office that is composed of the entire campus. But we'd rather, uh, we'd like to really spend a, a few moments just really trying to describe and thank those individuals that have been integral to the process of what we've done over the last year and a half. Okay. Ash. Yeah, so we really want to thank um, all of our campus community um, administrators and um, faculty and staff who really work hard to make our sustainability projects actually happen. Um, so extra special thank you to Mr. Steve Osborne and Allison Goff, um, Business Affairs, and Jen Stevens who designed our sustainability week poster that you guys have seen everywhere, um, as well as our partners at Physical Plant who work really hard to install all of our many, many projects and um, as well as working with us on waste, and as well as procurement and dining services. So um, Ms. Winnie Williams has done a really great job looking into sustainable purchasing um, and making a lot of progress um, with dining services as well. And finally, with the President's Life and their facilities. So we've been working really hard um, to establish a lot of programming with Recyclemania and working really, really hard trying to um,
any of this without these students. So when I say they're the linchpin of what we do, I mean that with all my heart. So thank you guys for everything you do. Um, there's also a person who really needs to get things. Uh, and she hates it with every fiber of her being, but Ashton Phyllis, our graduate assistant, has bent over backwards to make this week happen. She made all the reservations. She made all the catering reservations. She contacted people to make sure everyone is where they are, when they're supposed to be it. So please, everybody. Okay, so that brings us to our uh, keynote speaker of the evening, Dr. Richard Oppenlander. He is a researcher and lecturer extraordinaire <coughs> in sustainability. We're very, very proud to bring him here today to really help to, to kind of bring this, these food issues together that we've been discussing all year long. He's written a book called Comfortably Unaware, and I joked with him, when are we gonna get the book on Uncomfortably Aware? Um, and for those of us that really are aware, but we're so uncomfortable with the world around us. But this is, this is an extraordinary book in terms of trying to digest what is going on with not only food, but food systems, and how we are making our choices and how they're impacting the world around us. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Richard Hoppenlander. All right, thank you, Dr. Fisher. <laughs> well, well done. Uh, great transition, I love that. Uh, so, hello, Charleston. <laughs> Terrific venue. Uh, just beautiful, a beautiful campus, I love it. And uh, kudos to everyone in the sustainability group and department and all, everybody else who was part of it. Um, okay, so, so I plan to ask how many of you had eaten food today? And uh, I can see the answer to that very well. <laughs> so, uh, but on a, on a normal day, uh, typically what would, what would drive your decisions about what food you eat? Um, is, it because of, is it because of economics? I mean, that's, that's really important. Right? About, about nutrition, does that ever play a role? Uh, occasionally. Uh, what about availability or access? I mean, does, does that ever play a role? It's pretty important. If, uh, if a food item is not right in front of you, it's likely you're not going to go out of your way to, to find it. Um, but in the other direction, uh, that, that chocolate chip cookie uh, <laughs> just appeared right in front of me. I had to buy it. I had to eat it. It was my duty. Uh, many things can be played. But how many of you chose the food you ate today based on how it might affect a microclimate in Bolivia, or perhaps a woman peasant farmer working the fields in Mozambique, or even a, a small local fisherman casting a net from a boat off the coast of Sierra Leone, or even in general, the ecological footprint that your food choice might, might have. I mean, does anybody ever think of those things? Of course not. <laughs> Why would you think of that? I mean, most people don't, and uh, because after all, pff, I mean, there's no connection. Or, or, or is it? Well, many of the choices we make in life will have a profound impact on something else in the world. It's really why we have Earth Day at least one day of the year, to recognize that fact. But it's especially true with things you consume, like food. It's one of the major disconnects we seem to have. What you do here might affect something over there. And how to start looking outside of the microcosm or the bubble that each of us tend to live in, and then how to perhaps encourage others to do the same. Well, how does your breakfast, lunch, or dinner, for instance, what you choose to eat today, have anything at all to do with the shaman from the Amazon area in Peru, or one of the two billion people in the world without water, or the imminent extinction of the number of species on Earth, or the plight of this starving child in Ethiopia, or, or even the taxes that I have to pay this year, or should pay this year to our government, uh, what possibly could you and the, and the food you choose to eat have anything to do with these things? And many more. And, and why should you care? Well, let's, let's find out. Let's start right off with a photo, shall we? 
Now, what do you see in this photo without reading too much into it? Typically, typically one would see beautiful blue skies and green grass and some rolling hills, a little bit of water over there. Well, we're going to take a much closer look at this a bit later. So for now, I'd like you to make a little mental imprint of it and then tuck it away. Well, I stopped eating animals nearly 40 years ago when I was in graduate school. I don't need anybody to do math on this right now. From, from a health, wellness, and environment standpoint, I mean, it just seemed pretty obvious to me at the time. But, but also because of the animal research I was involved with um, quite heavily. And I still do quite a bit of animal research, but now it's more related to the effect of our food choices. So now it's more of this type of animal research, perhaps in the jungle, uh, a re remote area somewhere in the world, getting a better grasp on what sustainability might really mean. So that would have to include research animals like these at some of the largest and smallest dairy operations in the world, and these grass-fed or pastured livestock operations here in the U.S. and many, many countries overseas. This happens to be in the U.K. That guy really likes me. Not, not him. <laughs> I'm talking about that. <laughs> and researching farms like these. And you certainly can't leave fish out of the equation now, can we? As always, I'm going to examine the word sustainable pretty carefully, not just because Dr. Fisher told me to, but, <laughs> but because it recently has been morphed into so many different means, to suit so many different means. And it's literally the latest buzz. I mean, you can see this word everywhere. Uh, I found that the word sustainable for most people refers to our energy sector. How many miles per gallon gas your car can achieve? How many energy efficient light bulbs you can switch out to save electricity? And often to, to waste. How, what, when, recycle, of course, maybe even up a, up a level of composting, and often we think of economic or social sustainability. But in most areas of the world, no one really knows much about it. And they don't care to hear or talk about what effect our food has on our, on our environment. And that's because I think, especially a certain type of food, and, and that's because I think they're unaware. And they're pretty comfortable being that way, uh, despite the enormous effect. It's simply too challenging for everyone, culturally, socially. I happen to call all this global depletion the loss of our primary resources on Earth, as well as our own health. It's, it's still sustainability. I just think we need to hear it from a different direction, and we need to hear the whole story through an unfiltered lens. How many here are familiar with the work of um, Jamie Oliver, or Mark Bittman, or um, Michael Pollan, of course? Yeah, about the industrialization of food, high fructose corn syrup, eating less meat, all important? Yeah, sure. Sure, but these are just fragments of the picture. I think we need to move beyond all that and understand the entire picture, the sustainability of our, of our planet, our resources, and ourselves. And to do this, we need to always include topics such as loss of biodiversity, world hunger, sustainability of our own health, water scarcity, agricultural land use and efficiencies, state of our oceans and fish, and climate change. It's a pretty long and potentially daunting list. They're all affected. With food choice or life in general, I think, I think the key to understanding or solving the problem really begins with recognition that there is indeed a problem to solve. <laughs> and then how large is it? So maybe we should view the Earth just, just for a moment as one of us when we treat it as a patient. Okay, for instance, none of us are really aware of our planet's cholesterol levels or cardiovascular condition, are we? And certainly most of us are not aware of or even concerned of what, about what could be construed as the increasing size of Earth's cancerous tumor, or its sudden loss of weight. And if you had the opportunity to have the cancer removed, would you remove part of it, or would you remove all of it? Now, how about the failing lungs of our planet? Are we aware of those on a daily basis? This happens to be a rainforest being destroyed in Malaysia. Or are we aware of the traumatic and permanent loss of one of our planet's fingers, or, or arms, or, or legs, things that we may never see again. The Java and the Tasmanian tiger above are already gone. The really sea turtle's on its way out. And then there's the mental status. I mean, aware, are we aware of the severe psychosis our, our Earth is struggling with? And, and what else would you really want to call it? And is this seen from a factory farm or a grass-fed slaughterhouse? It's, it's both. They both end up in the same way, treated in the same manner. And the answer to all of this is no, we're not aware as we should be. Unfortunately, there are no annual checkups, and information about our planet's health hasn't been managed very well, hasn't been related correctly to our food choices. Once we're better able to communicate the reality of the state of our planet, the global depletion caused by our choice of foods, and once awareness levels are raised, well, then we can begin solving these issues and creating a truly healthy planet. It all becomes easier, just as could be accomplished with a patient. Well, the story for me 
always begins with these two numbers. There are 7 billion people living on the planet today. 231,000 added every single day. So control of the growth of our population is certainly an issue, but it's not nearly so much a problem as the number on the right, what we're doing to the planet. The number on the right represents the fact that there are more than 70 billion animals living on our planet that we raise and eat for food each year, and that's a problem. In fact, the 70 billion number is quite impossible to pin down exactly, and it's very much on the light side. Because on any given day, you may find that the 1.7 trillion chickens or one to two trillion fish in the world on their way sooner or later going out to slaughter for that year. We're going to look at a graphic about global depletion, and certainly there are other industries that, that contribute to this picture, but none have the comprehensive impact. Now, just how serious is this depletion there? In some cases, it's irreversible and spiraling downward quickly. All of these systems that you see are effective. And simply put, we're demanding more of our planet's resources than what it can supply. It would take one and a half to two full Earths to sustain what we're currently taking from and doing to our planet. Most of this is due to our choice of specific foods. It's serious enough on its own merit, but it's made much more so because of all the layers and layers of various influences that I think tend to bury the problem and certainly bury its solutions. And we just don't want to deal with it. We can put every other major problem in the world at the top of the list to fix, except for this one, and yet this is the world. Now, What's critical for everyone to understand is that this isn't just a factory farm issue. Not at all. It's, it's a raising animals to eat issue. And we're going to see that as we go along tonight. So look, we're going to refine our thoughts on global warming for climate change. But first, we need to remember that global warming is just one component of a much larger, more insidious problem of global depletion, the more total effect we have on the planet. And the most important thing that anyone can do taking steps to improve things about global warming or global depletions, take a good look at what's on the plate. Specifically, all foods derived from fish, livestock, and yes, that has to include dairy for many reasons, cheese, yogurt, even eggs, all, all part of the problem. Now, this widely cited study was shocking when it first appeared for most of us. I mean, how could the meat everyone's eating cause more greenhouse gas emissions than all the cars, trucks, planes, and the trains that we drive and fly every day? I mean, it was, it was hardly conceivable. We just wanted to put our hands over our ears. But instead of 18%, as the original 2006 United Nations report stated, a number of researchers, independent of each other, have now found that livestock can produce, it's possible that they can produce as much as 51% of all human-induced greenhouse gas emissions found in our atmosphere, mostly created by the respiratory carbon dioxide and land use changes that they didn't account for in that first report and by the methane production by these billions of animals themselves. It's not due to confinement or as a byproduct of factory farming methods. Most researchers now agree that the figure is minimally 30%. And this is also without factoring in. It's without factoring in all the greenhouse gases emitted because of our demand to eat fish. The fuel, refrigeration, packaging, processing, transportation, etc. Now regardless of where the exact number resides, I mean somewhere between 30 and 51%, it's not 18. It's 1997 Kyoto Protocol. And most recently, it was in December in Doha, where countries come together and they're, at least superficially, trying to solve this global warming problem. But, but none of this is being addressed. In fact, at the last meeting in Doha, it, it was postponed. So it's very important for them at these climate change conferences and everyone else to understand that it won't really matter how many light bulbs are changed out. And it won't matter how many hybrid cars are on the road if we don't first change out the way we eat. Well, nothing was really accomplished at Doha then, consistent with previous conferences, primarily because the two largest emitters in the world, which are the US and China now, they, they don't participate. And the 200 countries that are in attendance that do participate, well, they can't agree on anything. Uh, they need to read Professor Sandy's book. <laughs> and uh, they can't agree on anything. So, so now, the attention is turning to how we can all adapt to climate change, since it appears to be inevitable to all of them, rather than putting forth, I think, the effort to mitigate it. Every aspect of global depletion has a timeline, all those that I mentioned. It's not really a question of if we will run out of something, it's when. The most critical timeline of all, I think, is that of climate change. We only have a three to four year window of time from now to drastically reduce greenhouse gas emissions or we're going to see irreversible warming on our planet. 
in many, many other things. Most, most experts agree that if our planet's temperature raises just, just two degrees centigrade from previous historic levels, we're going to see catastrophic effects. Complete loss of island countries, severe droughts, flooding, storms. Some of that sound familiar? Yeah, that's because, that's because we're already halfway there to that two degree centigrade mark. In fact, the International Energy Agency has been quite clear about this window of opportunity that, that we have for us to limit global warming and that window closes by the end of the year 2017. To me, that sounds pretty scary, doesn't it? I mean, something that everyone should be aware of and a little bit concerned about. But, but what does this have to do with food? Huh. Well, that's a good question, because we're all under the belief that climate change is caused by the energy sector. Hmm? Electricity, burning fossil fuels, especially coal, has nothing to do with food. And that belief begins with Al Gore's An Inconvenient Truth, and it carries right on through articles such as this one by Bill McKibben where he blames Shell Oil, BP, and Exxon for climate change. They're the culprits. Well, they do have something to do with it, but whether it's with winning a Nobel Peace Prize, or at an annual global climate change conference that we just saw, or with prominent publications such as this, those with a platform have failed to mention or properly position the role of eating animals despite its incredible contribution of one-third to one-half of the problem. Well, here's some math to think about. Most climatologists feel that the planet's atmosphere can only take on another 565 gigatons of carbon equivalent greenhouse gases by the year 2050, with any chance to stay below a two degree centigrade rise. Well, it's been shown that raising livestock can produce, it's possible, they can produce up to 32 gigatons per year carbon equivalent greenhouse gases from methane, carbon dioxide production, deforestation, land use changes. So, so without, using, without using any gas, oil, coal ever again, it's conceivable that we could exceed our atmospheric carbon equivalent maximum of 565 gigatons by the year 2030 without, without the energy sector even factored in to the equation. To summarize the connection, to reverse the disconnect of our food choice to climate change. We have this. Climate change is very real. It's worsening, and the situation is urgent. Greenhouse gas emissions that, that we produce, anthropogenic, significantly affect climate change. Next in the sequence is raising animals for us to eat is one of the largest contributors to gas, greenhouse gas emissions, as large, or nearly as large, as the energy sector. And lastly, any food movement away from factory farms but including grass-fed or pastured systems will not solve the problem. In fact, it's going to make it worse. There's going to be more land use changes, more deforestation, more production of methane. 40 to 60 percent more methane produced per single grass-fed cow. So looking at solutions, what do we have? Some prescriptions for climate change. This is what we have. Well, the first approach is what I call the no worries approach, which some adopt. The no worries approach because it's not real, right? And I mean, that's what some people think. And, and of course, the other approach is to reduce our dependence on fossil fuel, just like McKibb and Al Gore and everyone else recommends. But renewable energy infrastructure, such as building solar and wind generators all over our country to reduce climate change, that's a good idea. But it's projected to take at least 20 more years to develop and $18 trillion. But we don't have 20 years. And we really don't have $18 trillion. Uh, I don't, anyway. So, so another solution to climate change would be we could stop eating animals today. It doesn't have to take 20 years. And instead of $18 trillion, it costs nothing. That's the prescription to mitigate, not, not adapt to, but to mitigate climate change. Well, interspersed throughout our discussions are a few themes. One theme is how information about this particular subject has been, has been suppressed. Uh, even mismanaged. So much so that objectives of many important meetings like the climate change conferences and many others are not being met. And that all begins, I think, with the words we use. I mean, how, how clear are they? Are they kind of conveying reality? These are all food movements that you're all pretty familiar with, I'm sure, that superficially seem to make sense. They make you feel as if you're going in the right direction because they're going away from factory farms, aren't they? They're going away from processed foods, and that's what we've heard are the, are the problems. Well, so that's a good thing, right? Maybe, maybe not. Do any of these words mean sustainable? 
Do we need to be healthy? Many would want to think so. That's what they base the movement on. How, how about the word humane? Does humane equal sustainable? <laughs> and if it does, which it doesn't, <laughs> who is it that tries to define humane for all this? Incredibly, there is one person alive today that the USDA and every other humane certified organization relies on for that definition of humane. There's one person. I mean, does humane even equal humane? You know, it sounds pretty subjective to me. Every livestock operation in the world has a completely different definition of the word humane than I do. This statement was taken and I plucked it out of the food service section of the sustainability policy from UC Berkeley. Their definition of humane raise, as you see, is sustainable. That's what it says to me, one and the same. Now imagine that. Also take a closer look at the logo across the top. It's pretty telling that their one snapshot depiction of sustainability is with energy and greenhouse gas emissions. Well, that being the case, then, then a third to a half of those wind generators should be replaced by the words no lives, no lives up for men. It'd be a little bit more accurate for Berkeley. And I'm picking up because I just lectured out there. And, and, and what does real food mean? I mean, I had issues with this pre-service. Real food's a, a very large movement today, especially among college campuses. It's, it's defined as being local, fair, sustainable, and humane. All four. Well, that sounds pretty perfect, doesn't it? So, so I brought two food items with me that I thought I'd show you. One's considered not real food. Uh, it's this, it's this Vega bar. It, it's not real food because it's made in Vancouver. It, it's not local. That's, that's pretty bad. And also, worse, it's processed. I mean, it's all put together for you. I guess you could call it processed. But it does have sachi inchi seeds in it. And it does, it does have four different types of organic plant protein. Really put together quite beautifully well. But remember, it's not, it's not real food. It doesn't fit the definition. Whereas this other food item I brought uh, is considered real food. And actually, I couldn't get myself around to um, bringing the other food item. I used to do it, but, but, but it's this. Uh, over 17,000 chickens are killed every minute, every 60 seconds in our country. And I suppose that's pretty real. And, and if chicken, beef, pork, or any animal product is considered real food, uh, how about these? Real food, too? Yeah. I'm oh, sure why not. They come along with it. And they're free. <laughs> and remember, the origins of all these pathogens are, are from animals. If every piece of animal tissue will have numerous contaminants associated with it. These are just some hormones, pesticides, herbicides, antibiotics, pathogens. So some of you may argue, what about organic? Uh -huh. What's he going to say about that? Grass-fed animal products. Well, for you, we have this. Many of the same pathogens, endotoxins, natural hormones, heterocyclic amines, many, many more, organic or not. So unlike the Vega bar, this poor thing is considered real food because it's local and because the real food people think it's sustainable, healthy, and humane, but it's not. It's none of those things other than being local. Therefore, the real food movement is flawed. It's flawed because the definitions they're using are flawed, similar to every other food movement on this list. Just because something is local, by the way, doesn't at all mean that it's healthy or sustainable or humane. It doesn't even mean it should be eaten. The only thing that local means is that it's not very far from here. We've got to look at all the other factors. Again, it all begins with the words we use. Are they conveying reality? Well, this represents a food term that's constantly used improperly, if not abused. Anybody know what this is? Well, it's a protein perhaps a rudimentary protein, and there are many variations of this, but when you're thinking about eating protein, this is what you should be thinking about, as in, I need to get my protein today, okay? Protein is not, protein's not, little buddy looking over my shoulder here. That's my research assistant. I mean, it's clear, isn't it? it seems pretty obvious. And, and, and what, about, <laughs> what about this group? None of these guys want to be called protein. I'm pretty sure of that. Especially in this piggy over there that they all really like. Now, and protein's also not the guy on the left here. And yet, that's what people are calling protein, aren't they? The guy on the left with the overzealous smooch and the, and the excessive amount of saliva they always have. I mean, it's a cow, of course, and he shouldn't be called protein. He shouldn't be called protein any more than the guy on the right. And yet, and yet we do. In fact, his name is Plato. <laughs> and what about this phrase? 15 million people heard Ted Danson proclaim his love of fish on Earth Day last year and every other day since 1987, and yet he eats them, okay, for all those years. Now, no offense to Mr. Danson, please, and maybe things have changed recently, 
but for him and 98% of all other individuals in the world, this phrase, I love fish, actually means this. I love to eat fish, doesn't it? Yeah, that's what he really means. If he loved fish, as in loving his cat or his dog, he certainly wouldn't kill and eat them. What do you think? I really don't think so. Again, it's how we use our words, isn't it? In fact, Oceanus Objectives, one of the most influential organizations in the world, their objectives were made very clear last year in an interview with their spokesperson, Mr. Danson, the fish. It's about saving the fishermen. And that explains quite a bit, doesn't it? There are three principal ways our oceans are being destroyed. And all three are caused, or at least heavily affected, by our choice of food. Raising and eating animals on land causes warming and acidification of our oceans, which are just trying to, to moderate things and trying to protect us. 90% of all the excess heat added to Earth's climate since the 1960s has been stored in our oceans, which is triggering extreme weather events and killing sea life. More than 50% of all excessive greenhouse gas emissions have been absorbed by our oceans, which has dropped pH levels, causing acidification by 30%, making it very difficult for certain species to survive. Surface runoff from livestock operations on land has caused more than 500 nitrogen-flooded dead zones around the world, comprising 95,000 square miles of areas completely devoid of life. So any meaningful discussion of the state of our oceans has to first begin with discussions about land-based animal agriculture. But, but it is fishing that has the largest single impact of all. Let's take a proper and more accurate look at our oceans. Incredibly large amounts of sea life are taken from our oceans in three ways. First, they're taken as target fish. You know, that's stuff the one you want to eat. Fish are also taken out of our oceans to feed other fish, part of the aquaculture movement. Um, and lastly, fish are also taken as bycatch due to the first two types of fishing. Well, that doesn't really leave too much in our oceans now, does it? In fact, in fact, our oceans are being ravaged. Now, now who here doesn't know that our oceans are being ravaged? Okay, well, if everyone knows this, then why does everyone we know still eat fish? There's a disconnect somewhere there. Fragile, interdependent, and very poorly understood ecosystems have been devastated. Over 90 million tons of fish were caught last year, with quite a few more millions of tons of bycatch which are all those other innocent sea life caught, killed, and discarded in the process of trying to catch that target fish everyone's asking for. Bycatch includes juvenile fish, all seven of the endangered sea turtles, sea lions, birds, dolphins, even, even whales. I mean, is this really worth it? I mean, this to me is embarrassing, and this should be embarrassing to anyone who eats fish, because of the 17 major fishing stock areas in the world, all of them are either overexploited or on the verge of collapse. 85% of all the world's fish species are affected, considered heavily depleted by overfishing practices. Now that's quite a bit of damage, but, but along comes this word, sustainable, to justify, essentially justify continued harvesting. We can now stamp that word on anything and then we can continue in the take, take, take consumption mode. And, and we can feel good about it now. Why? Well, because it's sustainable. I mean, how is that word even used in the fishing industry? Who defines it? Who monitors it? With less than 1%, with less than 1% of all of our oceans being regulated, which is the way it is today, who decides on enforcement? If you look at this carefully, the real answer, or you actually look at it not so carefully, the real answer is no one. And I say real answer because now there's sea life caught and labeled sustainable when in fact it's not. But it's still labeled as such by a number of highly respected organizations, such as the Marine Stewardship Council. Pretty familiar with those. There are many, many examples of this. Tuna, cod, pollock, haddock, salmon, krill, and hay, and so many. The Monterey Bay Aquarium Seafood Watch, highly respected organization, has lobster from the Gulf of Maine, both U.S. and Canada waters, listed as a good alternative. And they had it listed that way as a good alternative for many, many years now, but it's not. It never has been a good alternative. It hasn't been a good alternative for many reasons. Rapidly declining number of lobster in those areas, inefficient trapping mechanisms, and most importantly, I think, is the sad effect lobster trapping has on the critically endangered North Atlantic right whale. There are only 400 of these truly magnificent creatures left that we haven't killed. And nearly all of them, eight, over 80% of them, are getting entangled, injured, and killed in those trap lines. We owe these whales much more than this. So look closely, please. This young female North Atlantic right whale, to give you an example, died shortly after this photograph was taken. Found on a beach in Florida, essentially tortured, 
towing these lobster trap lines. Desperately, I want her migration route over 2,000 miles from Canada, where she originally became entangled on her fins, on her body, on her tail, in her mouth, around her head. I mean, what a struggle this must have been for her. Now, this is not an isolated incident. It happens all the time, which is why I'm showing it to you. So, you must ask, eating lobster is sustainable for whom? Elsewhere in the world, there have been an estimated 500 miles of non-biodegradable fishing nets cut loose from fishing vessels each year for the past 25 years, catching countless numbers of unsuspecting sea life. Essentially, these, these floating nets become depots of coagulated dead marine animals. So I think, you know, the Monterey Bay Aquarium Seafood Watch is aptly named because that's exactly what they're doing. They're watching all that's happened while promoting it to be continued with trawling, cursing, and long line fishing methods. These three methods are the most widely used in fishing. Uh, all, all three are destructive, difficult, but not impossible to monitor, and proven time and time again to be unsustainable. The only methods fully banned by these watch groups are using explosives and poisons. But both of those methods are on the rise globally because they're unenforceable. Each year, more than 300,000 whales, dolphins, and porpoises are killed in fishing gear. This is just one of the many prices that we all pay for someone at your table or my table eating fish. Eating fish that, coincidentally, is labeled as sustainable. So everything else on this list is considered and labeled sustainable, but none of these really are. And the list goes on and on. Cod with fish are only 1% of the original numbers off the coast of Newfoundland, more recently to a near extinct status in the North Sea, while stated that they were sustainable. They'll never recover in our lifetime. And cod are now a bykill. I mean, who would have thought of that? The cod enjoy swimming with other fish, like haddock and pollock. They're now being caught in large numbers. In the case of hokey, the new great white fish used by McDonald's in their fish sandwich, now because we decimated the cod species, which used to be everyone's favorite fish sandwich. You know, when you run out of one fish species, what's the, what's the smart thing to do? Well, we just go to the next. It's cereal depletion. But catching hokey causes significant trawling damage, obvious loss of their own numbers. They keep dropping the quota amount, unable to know what it really is, and the killing of thousands of seabirds and sea lions each year. So why are they calling that sustainable? And, and what is this? It's a good example. Uh, I, don't ask me, because I only know a few things about it, because the world's leading scientists don't know much about it. But that didn't stop it from becoming certified as sustainable, which it is. I mean, how does that happen? How does something become sustainable when you really don't know anything about it? This is the Ross Sea toothfish. More than 5,000 tons are caught each year, legally, maybe double or triple that illegally, and yet no one knows where they breed, where they spawn. As of last year, no one had even seen a young toothfish. And bluefin tuna represents, I think, all that we're doing wrong with our oceans. A year ago, the ruling was made to not grant an endangered status to them, even though their numbers had dropped by 92%, and they were already extinct in the Black and Caspian Seas. In January of this year, just one of these wonderful fish sold for $1.8 million in Japan, which will help matters quite a bit. Instead of eating dolphin-free tuna, I think we should be concerned about eating simply tuna-free. This is Monterey Bay Aquarium Seafood Watch's approved sustainable method now of catching tuna. Coral reef systems around the world are in serious trouble. The Great Barrier Reef has lost more than half of its coral cover since 1985. Most would think it's due to pollution and climate change. But the primary cause of coral reef death throughout the entire Caribbean region, anyway, is not pollution. It's not from climate change. It's from overfishing. An example in the other direction that we found in the Queens Islands off the southern coast of Cuba, where they haven't allowed commercial fishing. Their coral reef ecosystems today look the same as they have for the past thousands of years. One of the most important factors in balancing coral reef systems are apex feeders, predatory fish like sharks. Okay, but we're killing them too, quite a few of them. One third of all shark species are nearing extinction. We're killing nearly 100 million sharks per year. Okay, why? Well, 40 million sharks have their fins cut off like this, and then they're thrown overboard to die so that we can all eat shark fin soup. It's, it's terrible to see this, isn't it? No, but, but I know what some of you are thinking. Uh, you're saying to yourself, uh, I don't eat shark fin soup. No, not me. And, and furthermore, it's banned in five states in our country. 
Yeah, well, well, isn't that great? But again, over 98% of us do eat fish. And by eating fish, any type of fish, we're doing this, we're doing this to 60 million sharks that are caught each year and killed in fishy nets and fishy lines as body kill. So go ahead and ban the shark fin soup all you want. But my thought is why stop there? I mean, if you're truly concerned about sharks, then you should ban fishing. The most heavily killed fish species in the world is Alaskan pollock, harvested at a rate of over 3 million tons per year and still labeled as sustainable. Now, who would think you could take 3 million tons of any species on Earth from anywhere and think that they somehow wouldn't be missed? So, so here's the point regarding our oceans. It's no longer a problem of overfishing. I mean, that happened in the mid-1800s. It, it's about fishing. Whole Foods, Walmart, and Wegmans have pledged to eliminate all Monterey Bay Aquarium seafood, red-listed seafood by the end of this month. Compass Group joins Aramark as the two largest food service corporations in North America, pledging to phase out seafood on red list as well. But at the end of the day, though, it's not really about a pledge from, from big business at all. It's about how accurately the word sustainable is being defined and then how it's being used, how it's being implemented. In fact, I think what we need is complete and immediate restoration of all oceanic ecosystems back to a balanced state where pluses and minuses occur naturally, not controlled or manipulated by our wants or by an organization that's heavily influenced by money, which they all are. We, we, we want to eat lobster or Alaskan pilots, so therefore there's a way that they're sustainable. Well, no worries because now we have fish farms. 49% of all fish consumed worldwide are produced in aquaculture, which is growing faster than any other food sector. And one reason for this tremendous growth is the very false illusion of environmentalism. Asia now produces 91% of all farm fish in the world, shrimp, carp, tilapia, with a vast majority of operations being completely unregulated. The US imported over 6 million tons of seafood last year, and half of those imports were imported, or half of those were imported uh, from factory farm, factory fish farms. Here we have another interesting idea, I think, where fish are caught in our already ravaged oceans to feed other fish produced on, on factory fish farms, sometimes at a ratio of 20 to 1 in the form of fish, fish meal, fish oil. 88% of all fish oil produced in the world now is given to these fish farms. Fish farms can be located in our oceans, some in open water, usually it used to be pristine coastal waters. This is one of the many that I visited uh, tucked into the huge one off the coast of Scotland where just the salmon fish farms, just the salmon fish farms in Scotland produce nitrogen waste equal to a human population of over 9 million people. And then, of course, we have land-based fish farms. 60% of all fish farms in the world are land-based. Some are outside, like this one, showing me the protein that, uh, that they're producing there. And some fish farms are indoors. But I, I found that all of these, even the indoor ones, uh, still use excessive amounts of electricity, pesticides, fungicides, antibiotics, massive amounts of water. And, of course, all fish farms needlessly kill billions of lives each year. So is this humane? If anybody needs or wants to think about it, I mean, does anyone know what nociceptors are? Especially polymodal nociceptors. Well, polymodal nociceptors are sensory receptors associated with feeling pain. Most mammals have numerous polymodal nociceptors in and around their face, uh, their head, their neck. So do fish. There are now over 4 million fishing vessels in the world destroying ecosystems that have been in place essentially for millions of years. Our, our rainforests are still being devastated, still being lost. 25 million acres last year by combination of deforestation and degradation. And that's, that's pretty tragic. I mean, this is, this is what a few thousand to a million year old rainforest now looks like because the world's food priorities are with eating livestock, not with being stewards of other living things, as we should be. This is the sad result. Soon grass, pasture, and cattle will follow this in, usually erosion, desertification, and localized climate change as well. If you choose to eat livestock here in the US or anywhere else, you're supporting this destruction by fueling the global demand for meat. Brazil announced just a few months ago that deforestation in their country is broad excited announcement that their deforestation in their country hit a 24-year low last year. But what does that really mean? Because they still cut down 2,000 square miles of rainforest during that one-year period of time, just in Brazil. And tropical rain deforestation rates are increasing in Bolivia, 
Peru, Malaysia, and numerous other countries in the world. 80% of all rainforest loss in the Amazon is still due to raising cattle, with another 10% beyond that loss to due, growing, due to growing crops to feed them and other livestock. Remember, these livestock are grazing there. It's not a matter of factory farming. We've already lost numerous ancient tribes, over 90 of them, shaman, many, many undiscovered medicinal plants, millions of living things, I and mean, we'll never see them again. I, I don't think they should be lost in our climate regulation should be jeopardized because of our inappropriate, what I feel is inappropriate choice of foods. It's quite easy to quantify our global depletion of land with far too much of it being used for the wrong purpose. You can see it just about everywhere. This is how much land is being used to raise livestock. 45% of the entire land mass on Earth. Now, how accurate is this ridiculous figure? Well, it was documented by the International Livestock Research Institute. So most likely, this 45% figure was, was underestimated. In the US alone, nearly 78% of all land used for agriculture is used in some way to support the animals we eat. But, but listen to this, there are 92 million cattle in the US today, 70 million pigs, only 3% of those are being pastured. Only 1% of all livestock in general in the US, and yet we're still using this much land. If you're concerned about protein, well, you can produce 15 times, 15 times more from plants as you can from meat on any given area of land. With spirulina and chlorella, it's 2,000 times more protein. You can produce anywhere from 5,000 to 45,000 pounds of plants on one acre of land versus 480 pounds at best, at stretching the best of meat or animal products on one acre, regardless of what the polyface farm components will tell you. It's shocking, it's shocking knowing just how much land on Earth is being used for raising animals, how seriously inefficient this really is. Right there, there are nearly one billion people suffering from hunger. This year alone, six million children will die from starvation. How, how does all this relate? Well, 82% of the world's starving children live in countries where food is fed to animals that are then killed and eaten by more wealth individuals in developed countries like the US, UK, and in Europe. One fourth of all grain produced by third world countries is now given to livestock in their country or out. To be sure, to be sure world hunger has many layers of complexity. One of the larger reasons is tied to poverty, but another significant factor is the looming shadow of our current demand to eat livestock and fish, which is indirectly tied to poverty. In fact, eating these animals and animal products ultimately affects food prices, food availability, policy making, and even suppresses education to improve agricultural systems in developing countries. I know because I'm deeply involved in this right now. Give you just one example of land use education is in the Machacos districts in South Kenya, very poor area economically, as well as from a soil fertility standpoint, where programs implemented teaching the women farmers, most of the farmers are women in African countries, teaching them a few techniques, such as erosion and rainwater control with what they call fanya ju. Uh, I probably heard that up pretty bad, but it's like fanya ju, is uh, throw the dirt upwards, essentially to create terraces. And they began focusing on plant-based foods instead of livestock or feed crops, and their yields improved by more than 50%. In some areas, it's more than 400%. Now using produce to feed more people and even creating business opportunities that are selling things such as green beans, et cetera, to, to other countries. Now this works, but this type of education is being suppressed by the thrust toward more industrial and livestock-driven practices. Similarly, similarly in Ethiopia, where over 60% of their population is considered hungry starving, and yet they have 50 million cattle in that country taking their food, land, and water. Our food choices and production systems now have far-reaching effects, with most of our global resources trapped inside this livestock and fishing vacuum. In 2011, it was considered a record harvest of grain in the world, 2.5 billion tons, but half of that was fed animals in the meat and dairy industries, 77% of all coarse grains produced in the world now goes to livestock. So we can't blame climate change entirely, droughts, flooding, for the world's food security issues. Most of our food's going to the wrong place. Solving world hunger, though, is not as easy as simply giving them the grain 
that would normally go to livestock. That's always been an argument, hasn't it? Solving hunger in developing countries, though, I think demands a multi-dimensional approach to sustainability, establishing it on many levels, simultaneously with plant-based food production systems at the nucleus. So the model for su success at reducing hunger in developing countries, I believe, should look like this. There are over two million NGOs in the world, one million of them conducting humanitarian efforts. So, so we're not lacking good people who want to do good deeds, and these care packages that we talked about a little bit earlier of food are necessary as a, as a short-term acute patch, but, but that's not going to solve world hunger. They don't need more handouts. These people need the tools to create sustainability for themselves, long-term and through many layers. More than 80% of the population in most developing countries, especially in Africa, are rural subsistence farmers living in poverty and illiteracy. So these are the layers of sustainability that can be achieved for them, all centered around a purely plant-based soil rebuilding system. In doing so, there's no livestock. No livestock. We're losing other species on Earth at an unprecedented rate. With such a loss of biodiversity, plants, animals, insects, that we're finding ourselves in another era of sixth extinction. The current view of most scientists is more related to the, to the rate of extinction rather than the exact number that we're losing anywhere between 1,000 and most likely 10,000 times the background rate, that which has been seen for the previous thousands of years, which used to be two to four species going extinct per year. But regardless of the metric, it's now a, a massive amount. So, so why are extinctions, and what are we doing about it? The most recent convention on biological diversity was held in Nagoya, Japan in October of 2010, as a follow-up to the one held in 2002. And they found in this recent one that none, none of their goals from 2002 were met, not one of them. So they decided they better get serious and roll up their sleeves and come up with a new game plan. So they agreed to protect 17%, 17% of the remaining land in the world that isn't being used by livestock and they agreed to protect 10% of all of our oceans by the year 2020. So, so think about that. Seven years from now, we can all look forward to having 10% of our oceans protected. Nearly all concerned researchers agree that the primary cause of the rapid biodiversity loss we're witnessing today on our planet is by pasture or grazing livestock on land and by unsustainable fishing practices in our oceans. There are only 300 Mediterranean monk seals left in the world. One of the most pressing concerns that we have today regarding sustaining our life and future life on Earth is our supply of water. We don't have much we're using all of it. I'm not sure it's a, it's a regional issue. But aquifers and wells are already drying up. There's a growing gap between worldwide demand for water and it's really available. With, with so much demand, there's expected to be a 40% shortage in water supply in just the next 17 years. Now, what you decide to eat has every single thing to do with this. Scientists are, are very concerned about water scarcity, but, but I think it's really more a matter of water management, isn't it? Yeah, instead of focusing on technologies, I think we should be first looking at choices. It, is this a good choice? How about, how about any of these? Are any of these good choices? I mean, do you know that it requires more than 400 gallons of water just to slaughter one cow, one pig, grass, or not, conventionally? In addition to these other figures, for the act itself, we slaughtered 145 million cows and pigs last year, just in the U.S. Much of our fresh water is not fully renewable in our lifetime, and it's certainly not infinite in quantity. So, so how about some basics to help out with this? Has anybody here ever taken care of or babysat a cow or pig for a few days? <laughs> a couple, that's good to see. Well, then you know. It's a great experience, and, and highly recommend it. But, but you know, then the researchers are right. That, that every cow does need 20 to 30 or more gallons of water to drink each day, 15 gallons for a pig and less than half that for a chicken. Now, now this is important for everyone to know. One of, one of the many things everybody should know, because if someone wants to eat these things, I think they should certainly know what's going on behind the scenes. So just one of the billions of livestock, just one, raised each year, drinks 70 times the amount of water that one of us would each day of its life. An area of tremendous misuse of water and land combined is in the state of California, where among other things, they use 900 staggering amount of land. Anybody here from California? Well, I don't know why they do that, because it requires one to two million gallons of water 
one to two million gallons of water to irrigate just one of those 900,000 acres. And they all get irrigated, every one of them. It's sadly true. So guess where all that alfalfa and water in it's used? It goes to livestock. 5% to horses, the rest of livestock. 75% to dairy cows in a state that produces the most dairy. It could be grass fed or not, it doesn't matter. So how sustainable is that? The, the average household in our country uses 50,000 gallons of water in one year, according to the EPA, indoor use, about the same outdoors. It's quite a bit of water, and it's what we're focused on in times of drought. How, how to reduce this, of course. But the average person in our country also consumes 206 pounds of meat in one year, divided between 46 pounds of pig and 58 pounds of cow, 102 pounds of chicken and turkey, in addition to the 248 eggs, and 616 pounds of dairy products, which all equates to 405,000 gallons of water per person per year just to support that animal product diet. So now, a more realistic view that the EPA should use and we all should be aware of is that every household of three people in the US, well, they use, they use over a million gallons of water each year, not, not 50,000, 1.2 million gallons, and 96% of that outrageous water use is from their choice to eat animals. So whenever there's a drought or water shortage anywhere in our country, which there are, does our government or your community ever step up and declare a state of rationing or eliminating meat or dairy? Well, why not? Why shouldn't it? Now, pollution is a very significant component of global pollution. We don't have quite enough time to delve into it tonight, and it can be found in a number of places. In the US alone, all the chickens, turkeys, cows, and pigs that we raise, to, they produce this much waste per minute, 130 times, this is 130 times the amount produced by the entire human population of our country. And one of the many statements by the Environmental Protection Agency, which usually vastly understates problems. The subject of food choice and, de or, and depletion of our own health or sustainability of our own health is a tremendously significant and large topic. It's very important to take this into consideration when examining food security or sustainability. I mean, after all, it won't matter how much food we're producing if it's the wrong type of food contributing to ill health on many levels. So I call this segment, Why Do We Do It? Why do we do it? Because every highly respected health organization in the world today has a position statement regarding all the health benefits of a purely plant-based diet. We as a society just want to cover some of this up and we just don't want to make that change. The best way for me to summarize all this is to relate to you that of the four leading causes of death and disease in the U.S. today, animal products and animal protein are implicated in all four in some degree. Coronary heart disease, cancer, cerebral vascular disease, and diabetes, including the precursors, which are obesity and hypertension. This isn't just someone's opinion. Now, it's certainly not at all related to simply eating processed foods, although that's the easiest for us to deal with, isn't it? This is one of the many position statements, this one from the American Dietetic Association. Um, this list could include kidney and gallstones, osteoporosis, appendicitis, diverticulosis, kidney disease, multiple sclerosis, dementia, Alzheimer's disease, uh, bad grade, I mean, it's fine exam, I don't know. <laughs> could be related. Uh, it needs to be clearly understood, though, that the link today between eating animal products and many different diseases is as strongly supported by scientific literature and case studies as the link is between cigarette smoking and lung cancer. One of, of, of the five most common cancers, lung, colon, breast, pancreatic, and prostate, again, consuming animal products has been linked to a significant risk factor in all five, and many, many more. And I want to emphasize that this is about animal products and the type of protein which doesn't change if it's grass-fed. So $3 trillion were spent on healthcare last year in our country. Of that, many researchers feel that minimally, minimally, $190 billion were due to dietary choices related to livestock. And that, that makes sense to me because of this. This is what happened last year in our country with healthcare costs. These figures are just for a single year. It doesn't, it's not accounting for loss of productivity, which would double these. It's, it, it's astounding. Now, these are not just figures or statistics to me. They're patterns that tell a story about what we choose to eat as a society and what, what happens to us afterwards, the, the stark and very real consequences. So eating animal products contributes to all these costs. In fact, in fact many people who eat animals have all these diseases occurring at the same time in varying diagnostic degrees. Eating plants, on the other hand, contributes to none of these. 
In fact, eating only plant-based foods will take you in the other direction and will protect you from getting these diseases. In bullet point fashion, then, this is what I see as problems with eating animal products of any type. Now, there's not one animal product found anywhere in the world that'll give you much needed fiber or phytonutrients, which are extremely important for you to consume. These substances can only be found in plants. So, what are phytonutrients? We don't have much time to explore it, but, but, but why are they important? And what do they have to do with sustainability? Well, they reduce your risk of getting cancer. I mean, that's pretty cool. And through a process called apoptosis, they also repair DNA. They increase your immune response. They serve as powerful anti-inflammatory agents. Inflammation is a major component of many diseases we see today. And they're very powerful anti-aging or antioxidants. Plants contain hundreds of these phytonutrients, sometimes in the same plant. And they help plants survive from sunlight, chemicals, insects, other stressors. When you consume plant-based foods, these phytonutrients will essentially protect you in similar ways that they protect plants. Now, on a personal note, you're, you're never going to see me on, on, on the biggest loser show anytime soon. Um, well, well, because I haven't lost 300 pounds in the last 10 days. I have weighed the same since I was 15. But, but I have missed one day's work in over 40 years uh, from being sick or having the flu. Uh, I've never taken one medication. I've never taken any over-the-counter drugs. I prescribe quite a few when needed, but I've never taken anything in 40 years. And, and I'm really nothing special at all. Not at all. It's because of what I eat. And I want you to take a really close look at me. I'm 135 years old. <laughs> no, not quite. But, um, you know, this is all important, but it really won't matter how healthy you are if our planet is not healthy. It won't support the food that we need to produce. Over 90% of the world chooses food that's unhealthy for them and for our planet. These are just some of the reasons why. All of them are significant, but most over overwhelming, I think, is a complex, very powerful combination of psychological, cultural, social, uh, economic, and political interactions. So how, how do we go about solving this? Uh, I think that nearly everything can be solved with edu education in a way. Uh, you're extremely fortunate to be able to have uh, a lobbying group like you had to be able to bring different perspectives into the campus. I think that's very important. We need to reverse the trend of tiptoeing around this subject by the media and by other authors and educators and many of the new food movements where we're getting most of our information from. So speaking of food movements, buying local, as I mentioned, I need to clarify that a little bit, has little to do with sustainability other than from an economic standpoint, which is important. I mean, who would have thought that a study one study from 2001 showing that 28, just 20 food items had to travel 1,500 miles to get to a grocery store in Iowa. Who would have thought that one study would have created such a tremendous cultural shift to eat local foods and create new words like locavore and uh, food miles? But, but we need to be concerned about food choices, not food miles. And, and here's why. We now know that transporting food from producer to your retailer is only responsible for 4%, 4% of all the fossil fuels used and all the greenhouse gases emitted in the food production process. It's much more relevant to view this a different way, the cradle-to-grave assessment. Instead of greenhouse gases, which, which are important, what are all the detrimental effects to give these items to our plate? Well, to calculate that, you have to go back to where these food items begin. You have to go back to their origins. Using a life cycle analysis, you'd see very quickly that eating non-local plant-based foods have minimal sustainability concerns, again, other than economically, versus eating animal products produced next door that contribute these percentages to just some of the many, many aspects of global depletion. An important part of our solution process will be the development of new agricultural systems Community support agriculture, farm to table, small and local farms, real food, slow food, organic, biodynamic, traceable, urban agriculture, all only make sense then if they don't involve animals. Eventually, I think the wealth of any nation will be redefined in terms of natural resources and strength of its sustainable systems. Our survival may depend on how quickly and accurately we begin to define this word sustainable. We will we'll see sustainability becoming a growth opportunity or risk management strategy for businesses. There it is, essentially transforming economics. Futurists 
sit around asking themselves, <laughs> what one new idea will change the world drastically in the next century? Well, will it be new nanotechnology? Could be transhumanism and robotics? Traceability within businesses? Or even renewable energy systems? Well, in terms of ensuring our existence, that one transforming idea that, that futurists are asking themselves about is for all humans on Earth to eat only plant-based foods. But, but it's not so new, though. And then, there's our, and then there's our farm bill and policy making. Any political science people here? Um, well, <laughs> well, this is a great case. A great case. Here, <laughs> of few, sometimes frustration, sometimes futility. Here's our previous 2008 farm bill, riddled with serious problems. Um, and then look closely, though, because that's our 2008 farm bill. Here is our 2012 farm bill. <laughs> which is our 2008 farm bill extended until September of this year because it was locked up in political disagreement and indecision and now sequestration. I mean, what a tremendous opportunity this was and still is for our country to solve so many of our problems. We have ranging from our fiscal cliff to our climate change cliff to our health care crisis cliff. In many ways, it's all the same cliff. It's been frankly difficult for me to watch our policymakers over the last year spend so much time and money trying to construct policies based on improper definitions of the word or the phrase healthy food. Many of the major changes that were proposed for this bill are aimed at taking away economic support from factory farms and giving more support to small family farmers, thinking that by itself is going to produce healthier food. It's not. In many ways, it's going to be essentially shifting funds from large meat dairy operations to small meat dairy operations, and that's not going to work. So another misused term, tossed, I think, tossed operations. They happen to be the world's largest producer of organic carrots, with over 30,000 acres in operation, over 6,000 employees, and then I, to me, that makes them an example in a way of agribusiness. My neighbor back in Michigan um, is a small family farmer that raises and slaughters their own animals. He's certainly not an agribusiness at all, but his operation is the problem. It's not cow organics, because it's the type of food and how it's produced. It's not a volume issue. So I have another solution to dealing with accountability that get us on track much quicker, and I call it a, you call it incentives, you call it whatever you like, but I call it the eco and healthiness tax. And here's how it works very, very quickly. You're all familiar with the nutrition fact label. This happens to be ground beef or ground cow, something the average consumer would purchase. Well, consumers need to know what effect this product had on our environment while producing it as well as what effect it will have on our own health after consuming it. So we introduce the eco and health risk factors first. And in the event that these numbers or factors are a little too complicated, I mean, we could simply do this. We could put a little notation on the label or on the back. It could say this. It could say not so good. It could say not a good choice. Or, 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 or in the future, when all this becomes voice activated, a little Siri voice could, could pop out and slap your hand. <laughs> say, I wouldn't do that if I were you. Uh, now, this is a good start, but it's most important to reflect these factors into cost. And this isn't a carbon tax, it's not a, not a soda tax, which would vastly understate the problem, therefore it wouldn't work. It's an eco and health risk tax, something we've never done before, because the true cost to our environment and to our own health has always been externalized. It's never been directly paid for, with our heads always turned in the other direction. Well, this is, this is one of the questions of our future, this in aquaculture, I think. It's, it's a topic that's gaining momentum, and I, and I find it's a natural path for people wanting to so badly to hang on to the false sense of, of needing versus simply wanting to eat animal products. It's a path of least resistance. So let's look at a couple different ways to, to answer this question. There. There you have it. I mean, that's, that's one way to answer the question. I mean, he thinks so, and, and so do many others. My thought, though, is that we need to be fully aware of the consequences of our food choices, not partially aware. And, and we need to understand what we're doing to all areas of global depletion. We need to know the magnitude and the urgency of the problem. You, you know what? This is really not a go meatless on Monday type of problem. Now let's take a look at another way to answer this problem under this question, at how sustainable raising grass-fed livestock really is. To do this, I think it's time we're going to go back to, to we're going to go to the very essence of the whole problem, and we're going to give everybody in the room one acre of land to grow any food you choose. Okay, so so what would you grow? What should you grow? 
And I always say that at all my other college and university lectures, the students know what they want to grow. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I, they haven't told me what that is yet. Uh, <laughs> I tell them, sure, it's a great idea, but yeah, I probably should get a male hemp plant. And, and remember, we're talking about food here. And, and on this other acre, on this one acre we're going to give you, you could raise one grass-fed cow, just like many would want you to do, thinking it's fully sustainable, just like that New York Times multiple-time best-selling author does. But in most areas of the world, one acre is not enough. You're going to need five, ten, even 20 acres for that one cow. Now, this region happens to be, it was considered one of the most sustainable grass-fed operations found in the world. And here, I still found the ratio to be two acres of land for every one cow. So, with that one acre we give you, you would need to borrow some land from your neighbors, so you're already off on the wrong foot. So, or, or you could go this route, you could plant something like this on half an acre, you could plant kale, or any one of a number of different plants, thousands to choose from. Kale is a good choice, though, providing you with much needed micronutrients, fiber, phytonutrients, things that you can't get from any part on your cow. And when looking at global growing applications, I mean, how cool is this? Plants like kale and collard greens will actually continue to grow through extremes of temperature from minus five degrees in my backyard here through 105 degrees Fahrenheit. And by the way, for those of you who might have uh, might not know or might have forgotten that white material, that's, that's snow. And along the way, you produce three to four tons of methane and carbon dioxide. You've used minimally 30,000 gallons of water. In most cases, you're going to use a million to two million gallons of water for that one cow. Or instead, if you use your acre of land to grow something like kale, quinoa, numerous other combinations, you produce 20 to 50,000 pounds of food that's infinitely healthier for you to eat and for our planet to grow. It's literally astounding what you can produce on that one acre of land. With all the vegetables, fruit, grain, you can feed yourself and you feed your friends and your family and your neighbors. And you'll even have a few thousand pounds of great food left over. There. And you know what you can do? You can box some of it up and you can send it to all those starving children in the world. It can be done. It's quite an amazing difference, isn't it? Now, imagine, just imagine extrapolating that model out or variations thereof in terms of global use of our resources. And now answer that question. Answer the question about how sustainable raising grass fed livestock really is. That's what I'm asking before he dismissed me from my farm. <laughs> no, he didn't. And for those, for those who still think that eating any animal is sustainable, then it's time to introduce this topic or this concept. Relative sustainability, that'll work. How sustainable is it? to raise and eat any animal product in a relative sense as compared to plant-based foods. How can we best use our resources? What foods will have the very least effect on our atmosphere or climate change? Which foods best promote our own human health and which are the most compassionate? This is the way we start doing things in a relative sense from this day forward. So it's time to go back to that first photo that we saw. And you need to know that this is in Victoria, Australia, where I was researching the ecological effects of their food choices. Um, and instead of seeing beautiful blue skies and green grass and rolling hills, I, I like taking a closer look at things like this. So, so here's what I see in the photo. I see this. Depletion of land, air, food, water, and efficient use of the resources. It's happening here as quickly as anywhere else in the world. And I also see something else, which is the main reason I visited this specific area of research. Um, Black in this view for just a minute, we're all going to get out of the car and walk down the road a few hundred yards. And here's what we see. This thousand-year-old forest is what the cattle ranch used to be. And it was the home to numerous insects, plants, animals. There are three different types of eucalyptus trees growing here, and one animal in particular that I was looking for was now in danger due to destroying its home. It's this little guy. Well, all of his family members were killed. Thousands are each year. He now lives in a small, remote rescue area in that forest. And he represents species everywhere on our planet. They're being devastated by cattle or other livestock operations on land, fishing in our oceans, lack of awareness about food choice, and politics. In fact, koalas are predicted to become extinct in just the next 20 years by those few researchers who are close to the situation. It's quite sad. And that's what I see in that, in that very first photo. But when I mentioned then that global depletion due to food choice is not a go meatless on Monday type of problem, uh, this is what I mean. I mean, it's not enough. We need to be constantly aware of the fact that if your choice of food involves animals, meaning all livestock, grass that are not, and fish, it's the driving force right now behind global depletion. It's very, very real. And therefore, being real needs to be dealt with correctly. For instance, 
you've all heard that we need to vote with our fours, right? Vote with your four, sure. Well, well, don't do that. It's something we've been doing for the past 50 years. We've been voting with our fours for 50 years. And look where it's gotten us. I mean, let's give ourselves more credit than this by becoming more aware about our food choices and more aware about definitions. And then actually voting with our minds first and then let our forks follow. When you go to the farmer's market, one of the 7,000 we now have in our country, which is one for the sea, let the local farmers know that you support them. Let them know that you want organically produced food, nothing that comes from raising animals because that uses too much land, too much water. It affects our atmosphere, it affects our health. Let them know this. Guide them, influence them, inspire them. Again, you're going to be voting with your minds, not your forks. And now, about the Go Meatless on, on Monday campaign. Okay. If you do this, if you go meatless on Mondays, you'll be contributing to climate change, pollution, global depletion of our planet's resources, and your own health on only six days of the week instead of seven. And you'll be creating a false justification for your actions on those other six days of the week. In other words, I don't think we should rest